We are making our way through the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And this morning we are on chapter 14. So I encourage you to go ahead and turn there in your Bible. Because chapter 14 is a long chapter, and I do want to read the whole chapter, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. I'd like to read the entire text that I'm preaching because we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And the text of Scripture is infinitely more significant than anything that I have to say about the text of Scripture. And so we're going to read the whole thing here, 1 Samuel chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an epic. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other Sene. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his farmer bearers said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about twenty men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. There was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. And the watchmen of Saul and Gabeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priests, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priests, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow, and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews, who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel, who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond Beth Haven. And the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day. So Saul had laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people had tasted food. Now when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. 
And when the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. So he put out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth. And his eyes became bright. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food this day. The people were faint. Then Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright, because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they failed. For now the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. They struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, and the people were very faint. The people pounced on the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, You have dealt treacherously. Roll a great stone to me here. And Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Let every man bring his ox or his sheep and slaughter them here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night, and they slaughtered them there. Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night, and plunder them until the morning light. Let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. And Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. And Saul said, Come here, all you leaders of the people, and know and see how this sin has arisen today. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people who answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You shall be on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. People said to Saul, do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said, O Lord God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant this day? If this guilt is in me or in Jonathan my son, O Lord God of Israel, give Urim. But if this guilt is in your people Israel, give Thummim. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. Then Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son Jonathan. And Jonathan taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I will die. And Saul said, God do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. Then the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines. The Philistines went to their own place. When Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side. Against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he routed them. And he did valiantly and struck the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan, Ishbi, and Malchishua. And the names of his two daughters were these. The name of the firstborn was Merah, and the name of the younger, Michael. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz. And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Ab Abiel. There was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. When Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he attached him to himself. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And God, there's a lot here, a lot for us to consider in this next little bit. And so God, we pray that you would help us. 
Uh, give us clarity of thought, God. I pray that you give us understanding of your word, of what's happening here in the narrative. And God, I pray that not only we would, would we be able to understand what's happening, but that we would see uh, what relevance it has for our lives today in 21st century America. God, I pray that you would conform us more and more to the image of your son, Jesus. That you would help us to be men and women, boys and girls of faith rather than faithlessness. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Samuel 14 is about faith and faithlessness. At this point in 1 Samuel, the narrative is primarily about King Saul. But in chapter 14, a great deal of attention is given to Saul's son, Jonathan. And the reason for that is to show the contrast between faith on the one hand and faithlessness on the other hand. So let's consider, consider together four contrasts between the faith of Jonathan and the faithlessness of Saul. Number one, while faithless Saul hid in a cave, Jonathan attacked the Philistines in faith. While faithless Saul hid in a cave, Jonathan attacked the Philistines in faith. Now, if you've been with us, you remember where we left off last week. Chapter 13, we saw that Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines at Gibeah. We saw that that angered the Philistines, and so they rose up against Israel in response. We saw that Saul was supposed to wait for Samuel at Gilgal, but because Saul was scared, he got impatient and unlawfully offered the burnt offering himself. We saw that he was promptly rebuked by Samuel. He was told, what? That his kingdom would not continue. And chapter 13 ended with the Philistines still ready to go into battle against Israel. But it ended with Israel in no position to be able to adequately defend herself. And now, as we come to chapter 14, the situation is the same, isn't it? The Philistines are still ready to go into battle against the people of Israel, and Israel is in no position to defend herself. In fact, we see in verse 2 that Israel's warrior king is hiding in a pomegranate cave. Now, most translations say pomegranate tree. And I'll acknowledge that it was most likely a pomegranate tree that Saul was under, but it's more fun to imagine him hiding in a cave, isn't it? It wouldn't be the first time that he was found hiding at an important moment when his leadership was needed, would it? But the text tells us that Saul had 600 men with him. But speaking strictly in human terms, that would be no match for these mighty Philistines, right? For their army, their regiments of chariots and horsemen and multitudes of troops. Things do not look good for Israel at this point in the narrative. And to make matters worse, it appears that Saul is taking counsel from some pretty questionable folks. You see that there in verse 3, we're told about a man named Ahijah who was wearing an ephod. We're told he was Ichabod's brother. You remember Ichabod, don't you? In chapter 4, his name meant the glory has departed. Ichabod, of course, was the son of Phinehas, who you will also remember was a pretty rotten guy himself. While serving as priest under his father Eli, he and his brother Hophni introduced idolatry and sexual immorality into the Lord's house at Shiloh. And the truth is that those details are not incidental to the narrative. They are intended to alert us to the faithlessness of King Saul. You see, the reality is, brothers and sisters, that Israel is in trouble. The Philistines have them right where they want them. Israel's faithless king has no idea what to do about it. Which makes the actions of Saul's son Jonathan stand out in chapter 14 as an act of courageous faith. The text says in verse 1, One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. You see, Jonathan is not content to just sit around and allow Israel to remain at the mercy of the Philistines. 
So he said to his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. This is verse 6. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Calling the Philistines uncircumcised, he indicates that this is not simply a battle between Israel and Philistia, but between the covenant people of God and the enemies of God. You'll also notice that he says, maybe the Lord will work for us. Well, let me ask you a question. Why does Jonathan say, maybe? It's not because he doubts the ability of the Lord. Because the very next words out of his mouth are, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. He says, maybe the Lord will save us because he doesn't know the purposes of the Lord. I, I want to suggest to us this morning that this is in fact the right attitude for us to have as well. That we do not always know the purposes of the Lord. For brothers and sisters, we should never doubt the Lord's ability. He's the Lord. He can do anything. But we know from personal experience and from the biblical record that he doesn't always intervene in the ways that we would want or in the ways that we think he should, does he? I think about my mom's battle with cancer. I have no doubt that the Lord is fully able to bring healing to her body. He can do that. And so I pray to him. I beg him to do that, to heal her. I want the Lord to heal my mom. I know that he can't. But the reality is, I don't know what his purposes are for her. This week, I visited with our sister Alexis Makeley, as I shared with you earlier. We have prayed and prayed and prayed for the Lord to heal her body, haven't we? We, we prayed because we know he can do it, don't we? But the truth is that Alexis is not likely long for this world. Her condition is deteriorating. And apart from a miracle from heaven, she will most likely be with the Lord very soon. I want you to know that's not because the Lord is not able to heal her. It's because we do not fully know or understand the purposes of God and the ways in which God works in the world. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here. Remember they told Nebuchadnezzar, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Here's what they said next. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an unwavering trust in the sovereignty of God over all things. And that's the same kind of faith in our sovereign God that we see with Jonathan here in 1 Samuel 14. And brothers and sisters, it's the same kind of faith that I want to urge us to this morning. The Lord may or may not intervene in your life in the way that you desire. But I want you to be sure that he is able. And I want you to keep praying, to keep relying upon him, to keep depending upon him. Because he is able. After Jonathan spoke these words of faith to his armor bearer, the armor bearer responded, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. We all need a friend like that, don't we? Not a friend who encourages us to do just do whatever we want. I don't think that's what's happening here. But a friend who, when our hearts are set on trusting and following the Lord, will walk through us, walk with us through whatever may come our way. Uh, Jonathan isn't asking his armor bearer to go with him to get an ice cream cone, is he? He's asking him to go with him to the garrison of the mighty Philistines. This could get ugly. But Jonathan is confident in the Lord's power and the armor bearer is committed to going with him. Sometimes friends will try to talk you out of doing something that you know the Lord is leading you to do, won't they? That's not the kind of friend you need, is it? 
You need your friend to talk to you, talk you out of things that are disobedient to the Lord. But when it comes to following the Lord, you and I need friends who will go with us no matter what difficulty that may bring. We know that Jonathan is committed to following the will of the Lord because he comes up with a way to determine the Lord's will. He says, we'll show ourselves to the Philistines. And if they invite us to come up, we'll know that the Lord is with us. But if they tell us to wait, we'll know that it is not the Lord's will for us to do this. So they show themselves to the Philistines, and the Philistines invited them to come up. They knew it was the Lord's will. Jonathan said, come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. You'll notice Jonathan's humility here. It, it is the Lord, not Jonathan, who's going to give them into the hands of Israel. And, and not even into Jonathan's hands, but into whose hands? Into Israel's hands. Goshen, there was no reason for Jonathan to trust that he and his armor bearer could defeat these Philistines on their own. No, his trust and his confidence was where? In the Lord. But of course, the Philistines weren't afraid of a couple of Hebrews, were they? In fact, we see in verse 11, they derided them saying, look, <laughs> Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. But when Jonathan and his armor bearer did come up against them for this initial strike, the text tells us the Lord gave them the victory. About 20 Philistines were killed. The text says that they fell before Jonathan, which isn't super descriptive, but it, it seems clear that it was the Lord who caused them to fall before Jonathan. And the result was panic in the camp of the Philistines. The text says that the Lord even caused the earth to quake which magnified the panic among the Philistines. Now remember, where's Saul in all of this? He's hiding, isn't he? He was supposed to lead God's people in victory over their enemies. But he was afraid of the Philistines. Jonathan is the one who trusted the Lord. Jonathan is the one who attacked the Philistines in faith. Jonathan is the one who won this initial victory over these enemies of God and his people. While faithless Saul hid in a cave, Jonathan attacked the Philistines in faith. Contrast number two. While faithless Saul feigned godliness, Jonathan's genuine faith brought the Lord's help. The narrative picks back up with Saul in verse 16. Saul's watchmen could see that something was going on in the camp of the Philistines. But they didn't know what it was. Saul assumed that someone from his camp had gone out against the Philistines. He said, count and see who has gone out from us. Of course, he was right. It was Jonathan and his armor bearer, wasn't it? So Saul called for the ark, the text says. He said, bring the ark of God here. And calling for the ark certainly gets our attention because that's what the people of Israel did back in chapter 4, wasn't it? When the ark was captured by the Philistines in battle. At least one commentator suggests that it wasn't actually the ark that Saul called for, but the ephod. But either way, Saul is given the appearance that he is seeking the Lord. But when the Lord doesn't answer him in time, Saul gives up, doesn't he? He said to the priest, withdraw your hand. And the text says, look at verse 20. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews, who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel, who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. Verse 20, Saul, Saul gave the appearance that he was seeking the Lord. But when things got tough, Saul grew impatient just like before. He took matters into his own hands. But verse 23 says, so the Lord saved Israel that day. And the battle passed beyond beth Aven. Verse 23 leaves us asking why. Why? Did the Lord save Israel 
that day. If her king was only given the appearance of godliness, but forsaking its power, why did the Lord save Israel? It was because of Jonathan's genuine faith, wasn't it? Jonathan's genuine faith brought the Lord's help. There was no way that the people of Israel should have won this battle. They were outnumbered by the Philistines. They were outarmed by the Philistines. And to be honest, the Philistines were also braver and more courageous than the people of Israel also. But Israel won the battle. Why? Because the Lord saved Israel that day. As Jonathan declared in faith in verse 6, nothing could hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. I love the application questions that Richard Phillips asks in his commentary on this passage. Here's what he writes. Do we believe, as Jonathan believed, that circumstances do not determine outcomes when God is involved? Do we believe in the possibility of God's acting in our circumstances, opening doors of evangelism, providing resources for ministry, offering his might to give success where otherwise there would be only failure. He goes on to say, if we believe these things, then we will not sit in idle despondency as forces hostile to Christianity sweep our generation. We will not play the part of Saul in his inaction or in his pragmatic, unprincipled religion. Rather, if we are inspired by Jonathan's faith, we will do as Jonathan did and offering ourselves to the Lord's service, stepping forward into the scene of action, praying for the Lord to give openings and strength, and leaping into the opportunities that the Lord provides, confident of His grace to empower our efforts. You see, the point is that just as Jonathan trusted the Lord for victory over the Philistines, we too, brothers and sisters, ought to trust the Lord in our lives and in the work that God has called us to do. <laughs> because even when it seems impossible, even when the obstacles in front of us seem insurmountable, our God can do anything. He can save by many or by few. While faithless Saul feigns godliness, Jonathan's genuine faith brought the Lord's help. Contrast number three. While faithless Saul troubled the land, Jonathan's faith worked a great salvation in Israel. To understand what is happening here, it's helpful if we talk a little bit about where the events of verses 24 to 30 fit in the chronology of chapter 14. Because the text tells us in verse 24 that the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day. And this seems to look back to the situation just prior to verse 20. So it's not that the Lord saved Israel in verse 23 and then came the events surrounding Saul's vow that we're going to talk about here in a moment. No, it seems that the vow took place prior to the Israelites going into battle against the Philistines. And so we're kind of backing up a little bit in the narrative such that verses 23 and 31 seem to be describing the same event. The defeat of the Philistines by the Israelites in the power of the Lord. But this vow that Saul made shows us what we're talking about when we say that faithless Saul troubled the land. You see the vow there in verse 24. Saul said, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening and I am avenged on my enemies. Now you'll notice immediately that Saul is not concerned with the Lord's reputation. His concern is what? His own vengeance. So he tries the strong arm tactic to get the people to keep fighting until the Philistines are defeated. You're not going to have anything to eat until we go against these Philistines and we defeat them in battle. And in one sense it works. The people didn't eat. They followed Saul's oath. Even when they went into the forest and there was honey readily available there, they didn't eat even a drop. They followed what Saul did, was said. Except for Jonathan, right? The text says, verse 27, But Jonathan 
had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. So he put out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes became bright. Jonathan did what seemed reasonable, didn't he? He was famished, so he ate. And the physical results were immediately apparent. His eyes became bright. Now, this doesn't seem to indicate any kind of supernatural occurrence or special thing. Rather, Jonathan was faint because he hadn't eaten. And eating made him feel and look better. It was like those Snicker commercials, right? <laughs> but then the people made Jonathan aware of his father's vow. Look at verse 23. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Curse be the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. Which Jonathan thought was stupid, didn't he? <laughs> because it was stupid. Who wants to go into battle with a famished army? <laughs> Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they found. For now, the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. Jonathan basically basically says that what they had accomplished was because of the Lord. But if they had not been famished, they could have accomplished a lot more. As we keep reading, we see that Israel's obedience to Saul's oath ultimately led to their disobedience to the Lord, didn't it? The people were so hungry after defeating the Philistines that they started eating the Philistine animals with the blood still in them. Which was a problem because God had prohibited his people from eating meat with blood still in it, right? Leviticus 7. The people failed to consider God's law as they rushed to satisfy their hunger caused by Saul's oath. When Saul found out, he tried to make things right by building an altar where animals could be slaughtered and eaten properly. Unfortunately, he fails to recognize how it was his unwise oath that led to the whole situation in the first place. And the truth is that things are spiraling out of control for Saul at this point, aren't they? Well, we next read in verse 36 that Saul wants Israel to continue their assault on the Philistines. But first, after being encouraged to do so by the priest, he decides that maybe it's a good idea to consult the Lord first. <laughs> However, the Lord did not answer him that day, verse 37 says. Saul interprets that as punishment from the Lord, but certainly in Saul's eyes, it's a punishment for someone else's sin, right? Can't be his sin. He's Saul, he's the king. So he sets up this whole thing to determine who is at fault for God's silence. And ultimately, the lot falls on Jonathan, doesn't it? We know that Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So God is sovereign over the casting of the lot, isn't he? But we do need to ask why the lot falls on Jonathan. I mean, God could have made the lot fall on Saul. We know, know Saul. It was actually Saul's sin who was the reason that God hadn't answered Saul's prayer. Is it because Jonathan is actually guilty before the Lord? Is that why the lot falls on Jonathan? I don't think so. The text gives no indication of that being the case. I think the lot falls on Jonathan because the Lord is using that to reveal the evil of Saul's heart. Saul is responsible for God's silence. Yet he is so eager to blame someone else that he is even willing to kill his own son. Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. Jonathan kind of sarcastically responds, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I will die. And Saul was ready to have Jonathan put to death. And so the people stepped in and intervened. They said, shall Jonathan die? Who has worked this great salvation in Israel? They knew what was going on, didn't they? Far from it, they said. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. The people put their foot down, don't they? They stand up to the king. The implication is clear, isn't it? Jonathan has worked with God. Saul has not. 
Jonathan has shown himself to be a man of faith. Saul has been faithless. The text says, so the people ransomed Jonathan, so he did not die. And friends, while faithless Saul troubled the land, Jonathan's faith worked a great salvation in Israel. And finally, contrast number four. Though faithless Saul fought against all his enemies on every side, it is Jonathan's faith that points us to the one who is greater than he. Chapter 14 concludes with the summary of Saul's reign as king. As king, Saul fought against all his enemies on every side. The text even says at the end of uh, verse 47, wherever he turned, he routed them. Verse 48 says he did valiantly and struck the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. We're given a brief genealogy in verses 49 to 51. And then verse 52 says, There was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he attached him to himself. I think the point is that Saul's reign wasn't all bad, was it? Well, there were some good things that happened under Saul as king. He was supposed to save Israel from the hand of their surrounding enemies. We saw that back in chapter 10. And in many ways... He did. But Saul is not the one who's presented in chapters 13 and 14 as worthy of commendation, is he? That's Jonathan, Saul's son. Saul's son who would never assume the throne of Israel because of his father's sin. And Jonathan is the one who's presented in chapters 13 and 14 as a man of faith, a man worthy of commendation, a man worthy of emulation. And in his faithfulness, Jonathan points us to the one who is greater than he. You see, in the story of the Bible, since the very beginning, we've been looking for one who is going to come and make all things right. The seed of the woman who will bruise the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. We had high hopes for Saul, didn't we? I mean, he was Israel's king, their first king. We quickly learned that those hopes were misplaced, weren't they? We know that Jonathan can't be the king who will make all things right. Because of his father's sin, he never got a chance to become king. Jonathan was faithful, but not faithful enough. Certainly not perfect. 1 Samuel 14 leaves us still looking, doesn't it? Still looking for a king who will come and make all things right. And we even know our Bibles know that that king would not come for many years later, would he? But now he has come, hasn't he? Yeah. And he will come again. Mm -hmm. He came the first time to live and die to pay for our sin. But he'll come again, brothers and sisters, to take us to himself. All of us who are in him. All of us who have turned from our sin and placed our trust in him. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, our hope is not in Saul, is it? Our hope is not in Jonathan. Our hope is in Christ. May we learn from and follow the example of faithfulness that we see in Jonathan. But may our ultimate hope always be in Christ.